welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for coming out. Uh, it's great to be back here in Kent. Uh, I went to school, I graduated from uh, Kent. Yeah. Look at me now, back here. Showbiz, am I right? It's nuts, man. I went, I, yeah, I graduated from Kent, and then, uh, you know, I obviously, once I did, I wanted to uh, go and make it in showbiz, so you gotta, you know, you gotta move away. You gotta do what you gotta do. So I moved, uh, I moved to Cleveland. Uh, it's about 40 minutes from here. I don't know, one highway, two exits. It's not hard to get to. Hey, that's, you know, it's the Hollywood of the Rust Belt, as they say. And, and I've been waiting to die there ever since. No good, no dice so far, so I might as well do a special. You know, why not? It's taken forever to die in Cleveland, so I'm just kind of feeling it out. No, I do, I, I, uh, I do like it up there, though. I like, I like being in Cleveland and everything, and my career has obviously just been bananas since I moved there. I mean, it's just been quite a roller coaster, you know what I mean? I mean, if the roller coaster uh, had no hills, no mean climbs whatsoever, just kind of meandered around in a circle at about six miles per hour. It's more of a luggage carousel in an airport, I suppose, would be a better metaphor, uh, but it's harder to explain. I do like it in Cleveland, though. I'm doing all right, and I know I'm doing all right because I just did my taxes. I just had my accountant uh, do my taxes. By, by my accountant, I obviously mean TurboTax.com. Uh, they don't sponsor me. I'm just, I'm just a fan of the product. Uh, but uh, according to my accountant, um, if his numbers are correct, uh, looks like I cleared about 19 G's last year, everybody. $19,000. Yeah. Now listen. What people might not understand, I know that doesn't sound like a tremendous amount of money, all right, okay? And in a lot of cities, you'd have a hard time getting by on that. But I still live in Cleveland. I'm like a goddamn millionaire. And are you kidding me? I, I walk around that town like a Kennedy. I'm just walking around. Some dude will say to his kid when I'm walking down the street, he'll just be like, uh, hey, take your hat off. That's the guy who made $19,000 last year. Show some respect. Goes a long way, 19,000. I could buy 19 houses in inner city Cleveland for $19,000 and still have enough money left over to put copper piping back in all those houses. Cause you know that was stolen. You know it's gone. I know it's gone. I took it. That's how I made $19,000 last year. Wasn't doing this shit. You'll find out why. Brings me back though, coming back here to the old, uh, the old alma mater, uh, Kent State University. Yeah, it's crazy. Memories, had a bunch of awesome jobs, part-time jobs that I was terrible at while I was here. Uh, I was a terrible landscaper while I was here. Bad door guy, awful bartender. Uh, I also worked in fast food. Uh, did anybody else ever work in fast food at any point in their lives? <laughs> a lot of Kent Staters here, all right. Uh, no. I worked at uh, Arby's, uh, which is, it's, I don't know if you're familiar with it, it's an upscale roast beef bistro. Um, yeah, I worked there. Uh, and I worked, uh, I worked uh, at the, right up front. I was right up front, like, uh, dealing with people on a face-to-face -face basis, against my will. And it wasn't because I was good at it, cause it wasn't because I was good at talking to people or anything like that. It was because I worked at uh, this, uh, Ravenna Arby's, and Ravenna's like a trashy town. Is anybody from Ravenna? Okay, great, yeah, yeah. Your town's a piece of shit, that's a terrible place. You don't wanna live there anymore, just move. <laughs> Anyways, I was working at the Ravenna Arby's, and they, they put me up front uh, to deal with people, not because I was good at it, but because I was one of the only people working there who was presentable enough to be up front. Like, no neck tattoos. And I'm not saying I'm a dreamboat up here or anything. I'm not saying I'm James Vanderbeek up here or anything like that. I'm just saying that unlike my coworkers at the Ravenna Arby's, most of my features are pretty much where they're supposed to be on my face. I don't have an eye wandering this way or an ear sneaking down my neck. You know, I'm just, just normal looking. So my manager, Don, was like, all right, Adonis, you get up front. So I had to be up front and deal with people on a case-to-case -case basis. It was awful. 
Worst part of working at any fast food restaurant is uh, whenever somebody would come in and complain to me about shit at Arby's that I, as a cashier at the Ravenna Arby's, <laughs> clearly had no control over whatsoever. I'll give you an example. Middle-aged lady comes into my Arby's one time. She says, excuse me, why did you get rid of the homestyle fries? I was like, what? And she said, you used to have homestyle fries and curly fries. I preferred the homestyle fries. Why did you get rid of them? And I said, well, lady, let me just start by saying, you did the right thing coming to me. Good call. Clearly, I'm a pretty big wheel in the Arby's organization. I gotta ask though, what gave it away that I'm the one calling all the shots around here? Was it when you saw me just moments ago in the dining room mopping up a child's vomit because he ate his jalapeno poppers too fast? Is that when you said, there's the man in charge. I shall take my grievance to him. Well, regardless, lady, you're right, it was my call. I'm the one who got rid of all the homestyle fries at all the Arby's around the world. Let me tell you how it went down. This is, my, this is where that decision came from. I was uh, on an Arby's corporate retreat in Miami Beach, Florida. They flew all of us big wigs and muckety mucks out there, you know, for networking and whatnot. I was playing golf with the president of Arby's, Tom Arby's. Yeah, great dude. Great dude, lady, salt of the earth. So Tom Arby says to me, he says, hey, Mike, you're an idea man. You're from the Ravenna branch, right? I'm like, yeah. Yeah, I know your work, he said. Hey, let me ask you, you know, you're an idea guy. You got any hot new ideas that'll help us take Arby's to the next level, you know? I said, well, I'll tell you one thing, Tom Arby's, I'd get rid of those goddamn homestyle fries if I were you. They're mucking up the works. Long story short, lady, by the time I get back on the Arby's corporate jet, and it lands to drop me off at the Kent Airstrip. That's where you get dropped off around here. Homestyle fries were abolished around the globe. So yes, ma'am, it's my fault you can't have any homestyle fries. Tough call, but then heavy is the head that wears the crown. Am I right, lady? Now, if you'll excuse me, I've just been informed that somebody left an upper decker in the men's room. Part of my job is I gotta go, I gotta go fish that turd out of the tank. I bid you good day, and then I just walked away from her genuflecting like this. I just kept walking, and I just left. I quit. That's how you quit those jobs. You just walk out. Doesn't matter. That's the nice thing about working there. I've grown up a lot since then, you know? I really have, in my opinion, anyways. But um, still have a little bit of a monkey on my back. When I went to Kent State, uh, I went there. Yeah, you guys still win here. Good. Oh, man. Just love the name of your college. I love hearing it, say it more! Uh, oh, oh, God. Uh, <laughs> those are my sisters, that's the worst part. Um, I went here entirely on uh, student loan money to Kent State University. Anybody else on student loans at all? Yeah. Seemed like a good idea at the time, because I was 18 and an idiot. And I made, here's the mistake I made. I made the mistake of taking out as much money as you could possibly take out. The like loan counselor guy's like, are you sure you want to take out all of this money? I'm, it's, you know you have to pay this back eventually, right? And I was like, hey, you let future Mike worry about that, all right? That guy's gonna be loaded. <laughs> I'll sign anything. Uh, so here I am, and now I am future Mike. And it turns out that asshole college Mike was wrong. I don't have the money to pay that off and I will take that debt to my grave. And uh, it's all right though, you know what? They say, I know that they're still mad about it though because they keep calling me and sending me, sending me like, uh, you know, stuff in the mail and everything. 
kind of messed up. Uh, so I felt I wanted to like let them know uh, that from my point of view, what was going on. So I wrote them a few letters myself and I'd like to share those with you right now. These are letters to my student loan officer. Can we go ahead and play my loan officer music? <laughs> Dear student loan officer, sorry we keep missing each other. We sure have a real game of phone tag going on here, don't we? And it seems like you're always it, LOL. I got all your calls and letters and I understand your concern. It's difficult to believe that it's been eight years since I last made a payment. Where does the time go? According to your records, I still owe your company $42,800. Which, if I'm being completely honest, does seem to be a bit excessive for a Kent State degree in communications. <laughs> As I am still not completely certain what this major qualifies me to do. <laughs> Potential employers seem equally mystified. <laughs> in any event, be assured that I am making every effort to reconcile this debt. And please reconsider the threat that you issued in your last letter expressing your intent to involve the authorities. That sort of bully mentality will not expedite the return of your $42,800. If anything, it may undermine your cause. After all, as the old saying goes, you'll catch more flies with honey than with vinegar. <laughs> LOL. <laughs> Yours in friendship, Mike Polk Jr. Now, my second letter, my student loan officer. Dear student loan officer, boy, you sure are persistent. Sorry that it slipped my mind to tell you that I moved to Portland and changed my legal name. Brain fart. <laughs> Darn, if you didn't track me down though, student loan officer, you found me. You're like a bloodhound. Only instead of tracking rabbits, you hunt for $42,800. Money that I still do not possess. I do want to mention that I was both surprised and hurt when you mailed back the coupon I sent you. A coupon that was good for one killer back rub. A coupon I valued at $7,200. You said that price was ridiculous. That's only because you never had one of my killer back rubs. Trust me, you were getting a deal. And trust me when I say one way or another, I will pay off this debt. Yours in Christ, Mike Polk Jr. <laughs> it's my last letter to my student loan officer. Dear student loan officer, I have your son. <laughs> Seems as though the mouse is now the cat. I was hoping it wouldn't come to this, but you left me with little alternative. Jeremy is a wonderful boy. He may or may not have an extremely bright future ahead of him. That's really up to you. Children are such a blessing. They really are invaluable. However, if I were forced to place a value on Jeremy, I'd ballpark it around $42,800. And now I'll just wait. We're going to see what he says. I might, I might have a bit of a, I, I might be drinking too much, and here's how I know I might be drinking too much. You know how they have like, um, uh, police do the checkpoints, the DUI checkpoints sometimes, and they have to announce it beforehand, spoil the party. They gotta announce it legally, you know? Whenever there, uh, there's gonna be one of those, I get at least eight text messages on my phone from friends and family <laughs> telling me where the DUI checkpoints are that night. And by the way, none of them are being like, hey, don't drink and drive. They're all just like, when you drink and drive, uh, you wanna avoid these corners. <laughs> That's what they're saying with that. They get me. I know that I'm probably drinking too much because uh, of a bad habit that I have that I've uh, taken up lately. I'm not proud of this. I'm just gonna tell you, I get drunk and I do something kind of nasty, something kind of stupid. Uh, it's nothing too violent or anything like that. What I do is when I get really drunk, I, uh, I go on amazon.com and I purchase a bunch of shit that I don't need and that frankly I can't afford. And then a box arrives at my house two days later. 
that I don't remember ordering. And that's right, everybody, I said two days. That's because I got Amazon Prime, bitches. <laughs> Ladies, Amazon Prime up here. What do you want, baby? I can get it for you in two days, no shipping. Assuming it's Prime eligible. So I get a box two days later, and, I, and it's a mystery to me. I don't know what I ordered. For, it's like I'm my own secret Santa. I've got to try and guess what's in there. I'm like, what'd you get for me, drunk Mike? You do too much. Uh, what is this? Uh, that's the first thing I ordered right there. Uh, that's a breakfast in bed tray. That was just on my porch. Uh, I open it up and now, here comes the fun part. Now I get to try and think back two days to when I was drunk to figure out why I ordered that. Because I, I wouldn't normally order a breakfast in bed tray if I were sober. I'm not like, I'm not like a, a lady in an old timey movie on Turner Classic Movies with like a little bell. It's like, oh, bring me my soup or whatever. I'm not, why do I need that? So I was like, why would I possibly need a breakfast in bed tray? So I have to like go back and trace my, retrace my steps. So I said, two nights ago, what was I doing? I'm like, oh, I remember what happened, all right? I will, I got back from the bar, pretty drunk, super alone, kind of my thing. I get back <laughs> and I made myself some French toast, all right? About a little 3 a.m. French toast, nothing wrong with that. And then I was trying to eat it in my bed like a gentleman. Uh, <laughs> But it was on a plate on my stomach, you know? And I was also trying to watch a movie on my laptop and that's sliding around, you know, and everything. Everything's a mess, I'm getting syrup, I'm getting Mrs. Butterworth all over my sheets, you know? That was a lie, it really wasn't Mrs. Butterworth. I was just trying to impress you guys, I can't afford that. It was Aldi's brand maple flavored breakfast topping product is what it was called. Sorry for trying to show off there. So and the laptop sliding around, everything's all over the place. And apparently Drunk Mike was like, there has to be a better way. <laughs> so I went on Amazon, I'm like, breakfast bed tray, boom, there two days later, my life has been amazing ever since. <laughs> it's fantastic, I recommend it. Why was I eating at a table like an asshole all this time <laughs> when I could have been laying down? <laughs> so much wasted time. Now, of course, sometimes, it's a little bit harder to unravel, you know? It's like I get a little bit more of a mystery. Like I had a box show up, this is about a year ago on my porch, it had multiple items in it and I had to like unravel that mystery, you know? And it was, it was a little harder, all right? So here's what was in that box, I'll show you, all right? Here's the first thing. The first thing was in there was this. It's a, that is a magic trick called Dragon's Breath. Now what that does is it's the thing that lets you shoot flames out of your sleeves, okay? And I was like, you know, why would I have ordered that two nights ago drunk? I don't remember wanting to take up magic at any point, but what it was was I had done a terrible bar gig in Parma two nights before, and I had a bunch, it was not a great crowd. They didn't want us there, quite clearly. No one's paying attention. And I thought to myself while I was on, st uh, on stage, I was just like, man, if I had that fire that shoots out of your sleeves, I'll bet I could really get everybody's attention right now. Because I would tell like a joke and it would bomb, and then all of a sudden I just go, oh, I'm sorry. Are you not entertained? <gasps> Everybody's like, holy shit! I don't know who this funny motherfucker is on stage, but he's got pizzazz, you know? So that's why I ordered that. That made sense then, all right? But then the next thing, show the next thing I ordered. Uh, that's just lube. I bought a bunch of lube. It's Wet Platinum Body Glide, in case you're in. Good product, I recommend it. Again, not a sponsor, but I'm listening. Um, and there's no big, that wasn't a lot of unraveling. I obviously was pro probably trying to masturbate when I got home, like, better get some more of this. We're running, running slim on it. So I, uh, and I don't even care. I'm fine with that. You know, we're all human beings. Here's the only thing I took issue with was this. Go ahead. I accidentally bought uh, a seven pack and it was, I bought it in bulk. I bought lube in bulk. I hit the wrong button. I ordered like $62 worth of lube. I have so much lube at my house right now, you guys. In fact, seriously, if anybody ever wants lube, just stop by my house, bring a mason jar, I will hook you the fuck up. Yeah, you know, you deserve it. Uh, next thing I ordered, not that exciting, go ahead and show it. Uh, it's just some garbage bags. Again, 
the funny thing about this to me is I really just needed garbage bags, that's it. But I love that after I bought that other stuff, I was like, oh, and I need garbage bags. <laughs> Still kind of responsible while hammered. Down to like my last three, better play it safe. So I did that. Here, this was the real wild card in the mix. Go ahead and show the next one. I bought that survival knife. <laughs> bought a big Amazon jungle survivor knife. That doesn't make any sense. I'm not a violent person. I'm not an outdoorsman at all. More of an indoorsman, actually. Preferably an inbedsman. There's no reason for me to have. There's no reason for me to have that. So I'm like, Mike, why would you order a big, scary knife? And I was like, I'll bet, you know what? I think I know what happened. I got, cause Amazon also has streaming movies, you know? I'll be like, I'll bet a movie inspired me to get that. Cause I'm an idiot and I fall for them. Uh, so it turns out I looked at my history and I had watched this the night before, Rambo 2. <laughs> Rambo First Blood Part 2. So apparently drunk Mike was like, oh man, if I ever catch myself like uh, uh, hitchhiking in Oregon, I might, I might need one of those knives to get through some shit. I better order that. Now I know why I have all those things. But of course, the big question here is, uh, you know, why haven't I heard from Homeland Security? Because think about this. I got to imagine the Amazon guy called Homeland Security as soon as I made that order at three o'clock in the morning. Look at these things, flip it forward. The guy's just like, hey, just so you know. Just so you know, Homeland Security, it's Amazon, hi. Yeah, there's a dude in Ohio, it's 3 a.m. and he just ordered, he just ordered a Bowie knife, a bunch of garbage bags, a magic trick, and a shitload of lube. I don't know what he's up to, but you might want to check that guy out. I just, uh, I recently moved into uh, a new place in, uh, in the Cleveland area. I love it. It's, uh, and I did the first thing that I do whenever I move into a new place, I do this all the time. Whenever I move into a new place, first thing I do is I go door to door and uh, I tell each and every one of my neighbors that I'm a convicted sex offender. Uh, <laughs> now listen, I'm not really a convicted sex offender. Don't worry, everything's fine. Uh, but I don't care for children and... Uh, <laughs> I do find that keeps them out of my yard. You know? I don't need a bunch of kids knocking on my door trying to sell me tins of popcorn so they can go to band camp and shit. I don't need that. No, thank you. People always assume I'm a creep in my neighborhood. They really do. Just, uh, and it's based on my demographic. I'm in a bad demographic right now. And you might think, oh, well, look, the, the, the white male's bitching about his demographic. But hear me out. I am a, uh, I'm a straight, white, single, loner male, aged 35 to 45. That is a bad demographic as far as people thinking you're a creep. And here's why. My demographic does not commit the most crimes. We do not, but we do commit the worst crimes. <laughs> We're your Jeffrey Dahmers. We're your Ted Bundys, you know? That's us, those are my boys. If we're... <laughs> You're John Wayne Gacy's. Well, that's me. Those are guys are all in my demographic. I don't know if it deserves applause, but that's fine. Yeah! I love those guys! <laughs> I, like, pretty I'm in the demographic where, like, we're pro if we get you, we're probably gonna eat your skin or wear it. <laughs> One of the two. So I get it when people are hesitant. When I'm, oh, I, it makes people uncomfortable, you know? Uh, but I feel like I am being prejudiced against sometimes. Like for example, I was a, I, th just this last summer, I was uh, sitting in a park, I was at Lakewood Park, and I was uh, just reading the newspaper, sitting at a picnic table alone. And I know that's already suspicious. All right, hang in there. I'm not, my demographic is not supposed to be reading a newspaper alone at a picnic table in a public park. That's, public parks are one of the big three I'm not supposed to hang out, hang out in in my demographic. It's public parks, uh, Chuck E. Cheese, I can't go in there. Of course, can't go in there. And then uh, the other one is the woods. I'm not allowed to, I can't be in the woods. It's suspicious to watch me go into the woods, you know? I don't even find that people are as turned, like weirded out when I'm going into the woods. It's when I'm emerging alone. That's when they, you'll see, I'll come out of the woods and they're just like, oh, that guy just come out of the woods alone with nobody? Should we call somebody? Oh, somebody's gonna find something come the spring thaw back there. It's not good. 
So I get it. I, I, I get why it's a creepy demo. But still, I'm minding my business. I'm just sitting in a park, uh, reading the newspaper like a gentleman, you know? And that's when uh, I got interrupted because a child, a little kid, comes tearing over to my table. All right, he comes running up. He's like, ah, he sprung loose from his parents, apparently. He's like, ah, stops, looks at me, goes, my sister Caitlin's birthday is tomorrow. Because that's what kids do. That's how kids, they don't know how to have a conversation yet because they're idiots. So they just start right in the middle of the conversation, you know? As if I had seen him earlier and been like, hey kid, go find out when your sister's birthday is. Get back to me with that 411, whenever you get a chance, kid, thank you. I didn't though. They just, this kid's like, ah, hey, my sister Kaylin's birthday is tomorrow. I'm like, hey, that's great, kid. You gotta leave right now and stop talking to me or I'm gonna go to jail, just so you know, for no reason. I wanna earn jail if I'm going to jail. The kid sits at the picnic table with me. Yeah, sits right on down. Not even on the opposite side. Same bench. Oh, shit, put the cuffs on. Put the cuffs on. I'm going in. I said, kid, you gotta go. Right then his mom file up, realizes he's missing and comes wandering over to get him. She's like storming over, you know, ah! and she's just like, pack stat. <laughs> Kid's already fucked. I mean, let's face it. <laughs> and I'm sorry if anyone here's name Paxton. I, not, I'm not saying I'm sorry that I said that. I'm saying I'm sorry that if your name is Paxton. That's not a great, it's not an easy way to go through life. She's like, Paxton! And then she looks at him and she goes, you're not supposed to leave without saying anything. Are you okay? And then she stares at me. Oh, like I'm the Pied Piper of Lakewood Park. I'm just like, bring all your chubby little boys over here. What a perfect place for a crime out in public. Oh. oh, I want to yell at her. I want to be like, lady, listen. I'm not what you think I am, but I'll tell you right now, if I were going to like bang a kid, it's not going to be Paxton, all right? I'm not. He's going to be adorable, all right? I'm not, I'm not wasting jail time on this, on this kid. He's going to be a little dreamboat, but take that off the table. I didn't say that though. So the mom grabs Paxton by his hand and just starts walking away like, the son of a doesn't even apologize to me or anything like that. I'm the bad guy, you know? So I felt like I was wronged and I wanted to get back at her. I wanted to show her that I was pissed off. So this is what I did. She's storming away and I just go, hey lady. And she turns around, she's like, what? And I said, tell Caitlin, I said, happy birthday tomorrow. <laughs> I put my newspaper under my arm and I walked away slowly. Uh. Speaking of, this is a song that I wrote about children. Just sort of expresses where I stand on the whole topic. I hope you enjoy it based on true life experiences. Hey, little boy. Get the fuck away from me. I'm not in the mood right now. And you're not making any sense. Hey, little boy. Why are you so sticky all the time? Don't your parents ever wash you? You smell like maple syrup and piss. Hey, little boy, why don't you go play outside? You can even play in the street. Go ahead, I'm an adult and I say it's okay. Hey, little boy, please stop telling me your dad is strong. What? And that you have two dogs at home. That's not even a remarkable amount of dogs. Why would you tell anybody that? And that you want to be a dinosaur. That makes no sense. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> hey, little boy. They say children should be seen and not heard. But I tend to disagree. Because I don't want to see you either. Yeah, 
yeah, so that's sort of where I stand on kids. And um, they actually just put up a sign in my neighborhood that pisses me off every time I say it, all right? It says, caution, deaf child at play. I know, right? Enraging. <laughs> Every time I see it, I'm like, no, uh-uh. Don't try to pass that responsibility onto me. You keep your deaf kid out of the road, right? What kind of a shitty deaf kid parent are you that you're not telling your deaf kid not to go near the road where it becomes my problem? I know I don't have a deaf kid, but if I did, one of the very first things I teach him is to not play near the road. That's common sense. <laughs> I'd be like, hey, my deaf kid. <laughs> Word to the wise, stay out of the road. You can't hear anything. You're gonna get smacked. And I feel like I shouldn't have to say this, but I would also avoid train tracks and firing ranges for the same reason. That's what I would do. It's responsibility as a deaf kid parent. of you who noticed that I have mastered the art of sign language, it took years. <laughs> Only thing worse than kids, as far as I'm concerned, is teens. I don't like teens either. <laughs> Fuck teens, man. I don't understand them. I got hollered at by a bunch of teens when I was walking down the street recently. I don't know if it's ever happened to anybody. It happens to me all the time. I just got that look, I guess. Where they just open up the window and there's, and there's like, Fuck you! <laughs> and they just drive away. <laughs> care about that. I really don't. It happens to me all the time. I live right, right up the street from me is a Circle K. And I walk up there all the time, because I'm doing all right, everybody. You know how that's in, those, you know, in all the Tony neighborhoods, there's a Circle K within a, a stone's throw. Um, so I was walking up to Circle K to get just like a cup of coffee, you know, and I'm, I'm always getting yelled at by teens. But this particular day, they said something that really caught me off guard, all right? So, no, I can, I can roll with most of them. Like, all right, teens, whatever, I know. And they're like, fuck you. I'm like, I know, I know, I'm an asshole. Man. <laughs> this one caught me off guard, because all of a sudden, kid, teens roll by. I just got in my coffee, and the teens, one teen just goes, fake! And I'm like, whoa! And here's the thing. Here's the reason it caught me off guard. I just haven't heard that in a while. I thought we were done with it. I really did. And I had the perfect reaction when it happened for them. I mean, from their perspective, because I was just taking a sip of my coffee. And I'm walking, they're like, fag, I'm like, whoa, what? And I, and I hear them going, ha, 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 fucking teens. So, and here's why I realized it caught me off guard. I just thought that like all of us had moved on past fag at this point. Even, I guess I thought even teens who ride by in cars and scream at people had gotten past it. I thought even they were just like, one. the lead teen was like, all right, so we're all agreed. We're still gonna yell shit at people when we're going by in cars, cause it rules. It's like our favorite thing, but we're not gonna say the F word anymore because we've moved on as a, a, a hold on a second. Fuck you, I fucked your mom last night! Anyways, we've moved on as a society. And we're above that. But apparently teens and cars don't give a shit and they yell that and I was caught off guard. Surprised me. It's been a while. That word was very commonplace when I was growing up. We, we used to be a lot more homophobic and open about it back then. I'm not saying those were the salad days or anything like that. I'm glad we're, that we're at where we're at. But I'm saying uh, it was. It was like, this is, how, this is how commonplace when I was a kid growing up homophobia was. We literally played a game at my grade school that was openly called Smear the Queer. And everybody was fine with that. That wasn't even something we made up. Our gym teacher, Mr. Kandrak, <laughs> taught us the game during gym. He's like, all right, you boys are gonna play Smear the Queer? You girls, I don't know, go over and jump rope or some shit, I don't know. So it's a, here, let me let, run through the rules of Smear the Queer with you real quick. Don't worry, it won't take long. It's not, very comp it's not a very complicated game. Here's what you do. It's you get like 20 asshole kids, you know, like 12 year olds. You throw a ball in the air. Whoever catches it has just designated himself as the queer. And obviously it's the early nineties and you know there is a queer in your midst. It is not only your obligation, but your God given obligation to smear the fuck out of that queer. 
so we would chase them around and then we'd, we'd catch them and beat them up and that's the whole game, the end. We were essentially playing a hate crime is what we were playing. Should have been called hate crime ball. And then we'd wrap it up, you know, we're done at, at the end of recess and our teacher would come out and here's how, here's how like accepted this was. Our teacher would come out and be like, all right boys, that's enough smear the queer. You've smeared the queer enough today. Don't worry, you can smear the queer at recess again tomorrow. Now come on, we gotta get back to our studies, you little retards, get in here. Cause that was an okay word too back then. I now live in a, speaking of, I now live in a um, suburb of Cleveland called Lakewood, and Lakewood is uh, known as, uh, apparently, for having a very high gay population. That's the rumor about Lakewood. That's what people say all the time, you know? A lot of gay people live there and stuff, which, whatever. And the reason I really know that is because I have a bunch of asshole uncles who like to remind me, like Medina, Southern Ohio type uncles, you know? <laughs> who found out I lived there and they're busting my, busting my chops. They're like, hey, yeah, you, you moved to Lakewood, huh? Yeah, yeah, I bet you did. Yeah, you did. Uh, hey, this is you. That's you right there, that's a dick, you get it. You get it. I'm like, yeah, no, I get it. I get it, on. I get it, Uncle Ron, no doubt. It's not a very, you know, it's not a hard metaphor to wrap your mind around. I get it. My poor, uh, my poor aunts are even worse because they, they're not as mean, but they're like, uh, they're still concerned. You know, they don't get it because they're, you know, middle-aged aunts. So they're just like, hey, they're like, I heard you're living in Lakewood now. Okay, good. I heard there are a lot of homosexuals there. <laughs> Is that true? Or are there a lot of homosexuals? <laughs> My Aunt Carol said that and she goes, Is it a problem? She asked me if the gays were a problem. <laughs> Like gays are like a nuisance, like raccoons, you know? Like they, oh yeah, Aunt Carol, you know, gays are always getting into my trash, you know, just pulling through. You know, looking for old muscle magazines or whatever they might find, you know? Like, or they're always digging under my porch, you know? You know how the, the gays love to dig, Aunt Carol. They're just like, eh. I come out of the porch, I'm like, don't make me get my broom. Uh, don't corner them, Aunt Carol. Don't corner the gays. That's when they get nippy, they're like <laughs> It's not a good scene. So yeah, now I live, uh, I live in um, Lakewood, Ohio, and it's nice, it's very nice, and I live uh, in a uh, beautiful rental property, and uh, it's an up and down house, uh, and I have the downstairs unit, which is really kind of the baller unit, I think we'll agree. My neighbors aren't big fans of me overall, Understandably so, I get it and everything. Uh, one of the things they bitch about all the time is that I don't shovel my walk. They're like, why don't you shovel your walk? Somebody's gonna get hurt, you gotta shovel your walk. And I'm like, I'll tell you why I don't shovel my walk, cause I rent. I don't give a shit who dies outside this house. It's not my problem, I can't get sued. I can walk out, there could be like 10 dead people with broken necks scattered all over my front yard. I'm gonna step over them, get in my car and go to Red Lobster, because that's my plan for the day. <laughs> Papa Bear needs some cheddar bait biscuits. I'm not gonna let some tragic shit, I'm not gonna let some tragic shit that wasn't my fault impede my enjoyment of that. <laughs> Tell you what you can do, you can call my landlord. Good luck getting that asshole on the phone. He won't call me back. My washer and dryer have been broken for months. I've been calling him. Everything I'm wearing right now is damp, just so you know. I don't care. Neighbors don't understand me at all. Neighbor Pat th was mad because I wasn't giving out candy on Halloween to the kids. He's like, oh, you gotta be careful, man. You, you gotta give out candy to the kids. They might get mad, you know, the kids in this neighborhood. They might come back and throw, you know, whatever, eggs and toilet paper and stuff at your house. I'm like, again, Pat, I don't give a shit. I rent. Those kids can do whatever the fuck they want to the outside of this house. I guarantee it's no worse than what I'm doing to the inside of it right now. I promise you. I have a charcoal grill in my living room right now. I'm making shish kebabs. Do you want one, Pat? It's a mess in there. So I live, but I do, I live in, a, um, I live in the uh, downstairs unit of a house and there is a gentleman who uh, lives upstairs. Salt of the earth again, uh, great guy. Uh, Ryan, and uh, Ryan and I um, share a washer and dryer in the basement. 
and uh, I share his laundry detergent. <laughs> Listen, it's a great system, okay? And I know that a lot of you were like, hey, you shouldn't be stealing somebody's laundry detergent. Uh, and in my defense, I always mean to pick some laundry detergent up at the store when I go there, but then I get to the grocery store and uh, it's expensive. So I just use his again. <laughs> it's a great system, I recommend it if you can do it. So uh, Ryan started complaining to me about this, not to my face like a man. He complained to me by sending me messages on Facebook. <laughs> like a tween girl. <laughs> I'm gonna read you a couple, I'm gonna read you our exchange real fast and uh, you tell me if, I, if I'm the bad guy here, all right? Here we go. <laughs> and this is an exchange between myself and Ryan, my upstairs neighbor. His first message to me, Mike, I'm writing to ask you to please stop using my laundry detergent. You've lived here for over a year now, and you've never had your own bottle of detergent in the basement. I don't work to earn money to pay for you to do your laundry, Ryan. Kind of a dickish tone. I think we can all agree. There's a nice way to say that upstairs, Ryan, you know, just... Anyways, my response, Ryan, got your message. Thank you so much for bringing this issue to my attention. <laughs> but I feel as though you may be jumping to conclusions. Let me ask you this. How do you know that I don't just keep my bottle of detergent up in my apartment and bring it down to the basement when I need it? I'm not saying this is the case. <laughs> I'm just pointing out a potential weak point in your argument. His response, Mike. I know that you're using my detergent because the bottle keeps getting lighter even when I'm not using it. My response, Ryan, touche. <laughs> but if I could just continue to play devil's advocate for a moment, have you considered the possibility that your detergent bottle isn't lighter each time, but that you may in fact be getting stronger? <laughs> Again, I'm not saying this is definitely the case. I just think you owe it to people to explore every possible scenario before throwing out wild and hurtful accusations. His response, Mike, ha ha, real funny. I know you're supposed to be a comedian or something, but this is not a joke. I'm sorry you can't take this seriously, but what you are doing is stealing. You are stealing from me. And that might be funny to you, but it isn't to me. And I hope this doesn't get to the point where I have to involve the landlord or even the authorities. <laughs> Swear to God. Because I don't want to have to do that. Just stop using my detergent. Ryan. Ryan. Please. For the love of Christ. Please call the police and tell them that someone is slowly stealing your detergent. I am begging you to do this. That would be amazing. Not just for me, but for whatever dispatcher takes that call. Oh, I hope I get arrested and sent to the Mansfield Correctional Facility so I can tell my murderer cellmate that my crime was siphoning my housemate's color safe tide ultra. <laughs> Mike. Now at this point, Ryan did not respond for a week. <laughs> oh, we saw each other from time to time. You know, getting the mail and whatnot. During that period, relations can be described as chilly at best. <laughs> But after a week, he sent me this. Mike, not funny. What's wrong with you? I can tell that you watered down my detergent. What a jerk! It was pretty obvious, because it was so watered down that it took me a whole bottle to do one load of laundry. You owe me one bottle of detergent. And while you're at it, get yourself a bottle, too. 
you really need to grow up. You're pathetic, Ryan. My final response to Ryan, Ryan, contrary to your belief, I did not water down your detergent. I pissed in it. <laughs> I didn't really, I was just telling him that, just for fun. That's right, you washed your clothes in my piss. You're probably wearing some of those clothes right now, aren't you, Ryan? Can you smell it? Can you smell my piss on your clothes? Sincerely, your housemate forever, Mike Polk Jr. P.S. We are all out of dryer sheets. So. Yeah. you guys oh geez if I seem a little bit out of it tonight it's only because I'm going through some stuff right now I don't really want to talk about it but I will it's relationship stuff it's lame you know I know I know I just got out of a long relationship um, I just uh, it's pretty fresh we broke up uh, two and a half years ago and we had been dating for three and a half years okay and, uh, you know, so we finally decided, you know, go our separate ways. It was totally mutual. It wasn't like any, anybody was at fault. Uh, she and I and a judge mutually decided <laughs> that we should not see each other anymore. We all mutually decided I should stay about 200, 200 feet away from her at all times. <laughs> Seems a little excessive to me, but regardless. You know, so now I'm, uh, you know, back in the saddle and everything. I gotta tell you this though, everybody. If you get out of a, you know, if you have a breakup or you went through a breakup or whatever, what you want to make sure and do is, this is the, this is what we have to deal with in modern life. When you break up, how many people have just broken up with somebody like recently? Oh, okay, so just that guy. All right. <laughs> Everybody else is perfectly happy. Dude, we're getting drinks after this. Me and you, we're gonna talk about shit. Really emote. What you gotta do in this modern age is make sure that your ex is signed out of all of your accounts. Otherwise, you know, people will take advantage of that. And don't just think about Amazon and Netflix and all that stuff. Think of the little things. Like, for example, uh, I'm still signed into my ex-girlfriend's uh, wireless printer so I can print things through my computer. <laughs> all right? Make sure that you change your password for that. Otherwise, I'm going to pull into your driveway like I do with her and do this. Go ahead and show. Oh, there you go. <laughs> You don't, want to, you don't want to deal with that. It's a terrible thing to do to people. So I got out of that relationship uh, and it was fine. And uh, then, but again, it was three and a half years. It kind of, it was, it hit me kind of hard. So I started dating again. I made the mistake right out of the gate of dating. Uh, I tried dating a 23 year old for a while. Yeah, I know. It sounds fun. Oh, I'll catch him. <laughs> with just my tongue. You see me kill that moth? There's no one from PETA here, right? I've got a jail. Started dating a 23-year-old for a little bit. And I know that, like, to the dudes here, like, yeah, nice, yeah. That sounds like fun. And it does sound like fun. Who wouldn't want to roll around on a child for a while? But here's the thing. It's not all good. Did you know that they have opinions? Oh no. And nothing's happened to them yet, so they're not very well based, you know? It's like we were talking two different languages all the time. I had no idea what she was talking about. She's, she said to me, she's like, Selena Gomez is Instagramming life hacks for contouring makeup tips. And I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? Those aren't words, are they? Are those words? So that didn't last very long. I came to terms with the fact that I have to date women roughly my own age just to stay sane. And there's a problem there because if you're our age, if you honestly are this age and you're not married yet, and I'm talking men and women, and you're still available, there's probably something wrong with you. We're <laughs> fucked up. There's something wrong with all of us. There is. I know nobody wants to admit it. I can acknowledge it. I'm a, I'm a fucking train wreck, all right? <laughs> But yeah, there's a, you're, you're like kind of divorced or kind of crazy or, you know, whatever the hell you are. Trying to find somebody to date who's my own age is a lot like trying to uh, get your pumpkins the night before Halloween, you know? <laughs> 
everything's pretty well picked over at that point. <laughs> if you still want a pumpkin, you're gonna have to make some exceptions, you know? You gotta be like, I'll take that lopsided one. I'll take that rectangular one that has no stem. And I'll take that drug addict with three kids who cuts herself. All right. So the metaphor got a little away from me there at the end. But you get the gist of what I'm trying to say. Here's what I've learned, though, in my uh, time on this earth about women, you know, as far as wooing them and stuff, now that I'm back on the market, obviously, women love uh, making love to music, you know? It makes them uh, feel very special, you know? They're, they love making love to music. They're like circus bears. It calms them. <laughs> I'm a bit of a songsmith myself, so I, uh, I wanted to make a song. Women love it if you make a song about them and play it for them. Uh, because, you know, it makes them feel very special. And uh, so I wanted to do that for the ladies that I was, you know, pursuing. But to be honest, it's kind of exhausting writing an individual <laughs> song for each woman. So what I did was I created sort of a generic template song that applies to all women. <laughs> and then I seamlessly slip her name into the song right before the date so she thinks it's all about her and it's bulletproof. It works great, guys. Check it out. Uh, so this is, uh, I was just recently on a date with a girl, Karen, and I played this song for her when she got back to my place. Go ahead. I love making love to you. It's my favorite thing to do. Other girls just aren't the same. I'll always remember your beautiful name. Karen. I should love you. Karen. You're so special. Karen. So... Obviously, she's pregnant, and it's, uh, let's see where it goes. I know a lot of you are on dates tonight. That's fantastic. I want to help you out. Yeah, good, good. Yeah. Very proud of being dating people. That's good. Uh, yeah, I want to, I want to, like, actually do you a little favor right here. Uh, you're welcome, gentlemen. Let me go ahead and get her, uh, hot and ready for you, like, like a Little Caesars pizza. Uh, I'm gonna do that for you uh, by singing a very special R&B song that I wrote myself. I'm pretty proud of it. Uh, I need some help. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, my friend Leilani, would you mind coming out here? Thank you so much. All right, uh, DJ, kick that fat beat. Oh yeah. Just one more quick little thing. 
amazing girl. Please feel free.